From the day you saved my soul Till the very moment when I go home I'll sing and I'll dance and my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here this morning. If you open up your bulletin, you'll find a connection card. If you don't have a bulletin right now, just raise your hand and someone will bring one down to you. Does somebody have them? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we ask our visitors and our members alike to fill that out. It's how we keep record of our attendance here today. Also, there's a place that you can write any comments that you want to leave for us. And there's also a place for prayer requests. So if you have anything that you really need prayer for, somebody will be praying over those prayer requests throughout the week. So we'll have a minute and a half on the timer and go ahead and fill that out and hold on to that till the end of the service. Thank you.
y'all stay in worship with us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come. Lord, we are so thankful for this time to worship you, Lord, to come together with our church family. Lord, and in one accord, God, just sing praises and sing worship to you. Lord, right now we fix our hearts and we fix our eyes on you. Lord, we pray that we would honor you with our praise this morning, God. Lord, we lay aside any distraction right now, God. We just set it aside and we focus everything on you, God. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. Lord, that you are among your people. Lord, we praise you and we worship you this morning, God. And I believe in the sun. And I believe in the risen one. And I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. dead in the grave I was covered in sin and shame I heard mercy call my name He rolled the stone away Amen continue to worship you this morning, God. We just, we just want to thank you for the cross. Lord, our hearts are so grateful. We cannot thank you enough for the sacrifice that you made for us so that we could live, so that we could live eternally with you, God, but also as we, Lord, as we walk in this life, Lord, that we could have an abundant life. Lord, and I know that it's not always going to be easy, Lord, but within you, God, that there is hope. Lord, there is peace. Lord, there is grace. God, and there is victory and purpose when we walk in you, God. 
Lord, you are our hope. Lord, when all else fails and we feel like everything is lost and our hope is fading, God, we reach out and we cling to you. God, to the hem of your garment, God, and we are healed. Lord, we just pray right now that, Lord, your peace would be in this place. Lord, as I pray, I just feel like there's those in this room right now, Lord, that just need your hope and they need your peace. Lord, just struggling, God, maybe barely holding on. God, you are our living, breathing hope, alive and well in the hearts of your people. God, we worship you, Lord. We lift you high. We exalt you. Lord, do your work in this room, in this place right now, Lord. We ask for you to move. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. breathe out of the silence the road 
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. The salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. God, we thank you again for this time to worship you. God, just to sing your praise. Lord, and that you are so faithful, Lord, when we call upon your name, Lord, that you are right there. Lord, and you're ready to work in our hearts. You're ready to change us. You're ready to teach us if we'll just open our hearts and listen, God. So we do that right now in this place. We pray that you would just soften our hearts, Lord, if there's anything that is standing between us and you, God, that you would just tear that wall down and break that barrier down. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our church body, in our lives, Lord, in the body of believers here at McQueenie. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we pray right now that you would be with our pastor as he comes to teach. Lord, that we would um, just be open to what you want to tell us, Lord, and that you would use him as a vessel and speak through him this morning. God, and again, thank you, God, for the privilege and honor to worship you and to lift you high. We pray that you've been exalted in this place this morning. We ask all of these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. I think my battery's going dead, so not not my battery, but my my voice, my, my yeah, my microphone battery, my my battery's charged. Okay, okay. So, thank y'all for great worship this morning. Uh, worship team, beautiful job today. So, uh, just going to start with a question. Um, with uh, if you are you a complainer? Raise your hand if you're a complainer. Come on, raise them up. Don't lie. Come on. Okay, the person sitting next to you doesn't have their hand up. Okay, say, welcome to the service, Jesus. <laughs> welcome, Jesus. Because <laughs> I, I just know for a fact that I'm going to be hitting everybody right on the head today, <laughs> including moi, myself. So uh, we, we, we all do complain, don't we? We're talking about things we're going to quit. Uh, you know, we, we often talk about don't throw in the towel, don't quit. But then there are some things that we actually do need to quit, don't we? And we talked about one last week. We need to quit making excuses. So we talked about a little bit about that. Today we're going to talk about quitting complaining, okay? Now, I, I just did a little research this week, and I put it out on my Facebook and asked um, my Facebook friends to tell me what are you tempted to complain about. Some of you did respond to that, and, um, and I had people, a lot of different people did. And I've learned some interesting things. I, I learned that guys, for the most part, um, I don't know how to say this. At least, okay, based on my research, my Facebook, my thorough Facebook research project, uh, men don't complain as much as women because the vast majority of my responses were from, from you ladies, okay? But I did find out from the guys that most guys are complaining about kind of the same things, same things I complain about. I complain about traffic. I complain about waiting in line at the grocery store. I complain about waiting for the food at the restaurant. I complain about, and if you hadn't picked up on it, I complain about waiting. And I heard a lot of guys say the same thing. Traffic, things that are tangible, you know, things that you can actually point to and say, okay, that, that I complain about. Ladies, y'all are a little bit different. I mean, your complaints were far-reaching, okay? Some ladies complained, complained about their husbands. Uh, some complained about their children. Uh, some complained about their parents. So, you know, some complained that um, they, they just couldn't get the service that they wanted when they called the, the, you know, the, 
number at the bank or wherever, and you get the, you get the um, menu that you're supposed to push the button, number one, and you have to listen to two or three times. And uh, I had at least one lady said, I'm really ticked off when they don't have the right menu item. I'm listening, and there's no menu item that matches what I need. I need to talk to somebody. So we find all kinds of things to complain about in this life. And you know what we tend to do? We tend to kind of dismiss it, honestly. We don't, I don't know that we even think about it being a sin. I don't know that we think about it being something that's wrong in our lives. So we're going to look at that today. Uh, I want to begin by bringing up one of the guys in the Bible that I would say, okay, you probably agree with me. I say, if anybody had a right to complain, Job had a right to complain. But here's what he says. Here's what Job says in, in uh, Job 10, 1. He said, I loathe my very life. You ever felt like that? Ever felt like you were in a place where you just, there was just nothing in your life that you felt like you, that was good? And just loathe? I mean, that's a strong word. I loathe my very life. Of course, Job had lost a lot. In fact, Job had lost just about everything in this worldly sense. And yet, God was watching over him. But he says, I loathe my very life. And listen to this. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. A couple of things I want you to notice about that. First of all, the complaints are, are resonating from the bitterness of his soul. Complaints come from within. Complaints are something that arise out of and, and, uh, the bitterness of our soul. But also, you notice it, he says, I will give free reign to my complaint. I think, I think there's a sense in which Today, in our generation, us, I, I mean, I think, I think we don't see complaining as, as really something that's wrong. I mean, I think we just kind of think it's a part of life. Everybody does it. Everybody complains. And we, and we come up with excuses for why we do it. And we have our reasons. And, and you know, but, but we, we have this sense that, like Job, that I'm just going to give free reign to my negative feelings and my complaints and my emotions. And that's kind of where I think we are today. I want to point out one thing at the beginning of this message. Even though Job said, I'm giving free reign to my complaining, um, I want you to know that there is a difference between having an honest conversation with someone about an issue in your life. Uh, there's a, there's, there is, uh, you can have an honest conversation with God about the things in your life. In fact, you can even get a little bit angry with God about the things in your life. Okay? He's not going to strike you down if you're talking to him and coming to him from a sincere heart and you're, and you're troubled and you're, you're having difficulty. I mean, God expects you to come to him with those things and to pray. So there's a difference between having a, an honest conversation, not only with God but with others, about things that maybe need to be changed or things that need to be done. Okay, those are honest conversations. That's different from complaining. Complaining is just whining on steroids. You know, complaining is just pointing out things that are wrong without looking for any solution or answer. It's just voicing, giving voice to negative emotions and negative feelings about your life. So I'm saying this morning that we're not talking about the honest conversations in life that are leading to change in your life and lives of others. I'm talking about complaining that is just irritating. <laughs> I want to talk first about the grand champion, the grand champion complainers in the Bible. Okay? Anybody want to just venture a guess who the grand champion complainers are? The Israelites. <laughs> the Israelites. Okay. Yeah, well, we, we probably took their place. Okay? In, in our generation, we've probably taken their place. But the Israelites were the grand champion complainers of the Bible. Listen to what happened uh, in Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 4. It says, in the desert... The whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Now, Moses was the leader leading the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, brought them into the wilderness, and they are following uh, Moses and Aaron. Okay? And so who do they go to complain to? They go to Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Oh, yeah, that would have been much better. There we sat around pots of meat. I just had a picture in my mind, a big pot of meat. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with that picture. 
But they said we have so much. And, and when we were in Egypt, we had it made, did they? Weren't they the ones that were crying out under their suffering for God to deliver them? But we had it made when we were in Egypt. We often think like that, don't we? He said, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Boy, that's quite an accusation, isn't it? You know, when they go to actually go to God with that, when Moses goes to God with that complaint, you know what the Lord tells them? The Lord says, well, Moses, Aaron, it's you the people are complaining to, but it's me that the people are complaining about. It's me that the people are complaining about. So here's the thing. As we launch off this morning, um, if, if, um, if you haven't had anything to complain about, you probably will by the time this message is over, okay? But when we talk about complaining, we have to understand that, that, it is, um, that there are huge consequences. There are huge things that come out of our complaining, just as we see in the lives of Moses and Aaron, the people of, of Israel in the wilderness. You know, their complaining is going to bring about a result. So we can decide. See, just like we, last week we said, we can decide not to make excuses. Okay? And this morning, I'm here to tell you, we can decide not to complain. It's a choice that we need to make, that we want to make. And the reason I'm telling you this is more, and the reason I'm preaching this message is because I think that the end result of that, the end result of complaining in your life and the end result of stopping it are going to be amazing. I don't think we realize the, the impact that our complaining has on the world around us. So we can choose to be divisive. We can choose to hurt the heart of God. We can choose to drive other people away. We can choose to have this bubble of negativity around us all the time. Or we can choose to do as the Word of God says and say things that are positive. So let's talk first about the cost of complaining. Is there a cost to it? I mean, is there a cost to our complaining? I think about it like this. I think about when my kids were growing up. You know what? When your kids are growing up and you've done everything you can as a parent, right? You've done everything you can to provide everything for them, even not just the things that they need, but you've tried to provide the things that they really want to make their lives happy and enjoyable. And so you've given them everything. You have literally taken care of them, given them everything and walk in the room and say, I, got, I don't have anything to do. I'm bored. I'm bored. What do, you want to, what do you want to say at that moment? I'm just asking you. What do you want to say in that very moment? I can't repeat it. Okay. No, you just want to say, look, hey, what is wrong with you? Don't you see what I've done for you? Quit your whining. You've got, you've got it made in this life, and yet you're complaining. I think God looks at us the same way. <laughs> Come on now. Many of us are really irritating to our God. You know, we're complaining about things all the time. And I think God is looking down and he's going, hey, wait a minute, didn't I, didn't I give you everything you have? You know, why are you complaining about your kids? I gave them to you, you asked for them. Why are you complaining about them? Complain about your mom and dad. How about if I just took them away and you were on your own? That'd be good, would that be? Yeah, I mean, we're complaining to God about everything and it's offensive to him. The cost of complaining is that it is offensive to our God. That ought to be enough right there. It, we're, it's offensive. Listen to what it says in Numbers 11. We're still talking about the Israelites here. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. By the way, everything we say is in the hearing of the Lord. I mean, I, I read that and I went, hmm, that's true. But everything we say is in the hearing of the Lord. What that's really telling us is that they, they were not talking to God. What that's telling us is that they were talking about God. It tells us that, that, that their complaints weren't a prayer that they had brought to their, their Savior, saying, God, would you help us with this? We don't understand. Would you help us understand how to get through this? What do you want us to do? No, they were just complaining in his hearing. That means they weren't asking God anything. They were just whining in his hearing. Now listen to what happens. He said, I have heard the, uh, heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. 
I've heard the complaints, okay? So tell them, as surely as I live, now it gives a lot of things, but then down in verse 30, this is the cl clincher here. In verse 30, he says, as surely as I live, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home. They've been complaining ever since they left Egypt. And, and God had said, the, the uplifted hand, it simply means that God had, had, had made a vow to them, had made a covenant with them that they could trust and they could believe. But now God is saying, listen, I am so, listen, I am so sick and tired of your constant complaining and, and whining. He said that this is it. This is where it ends. You're not going into the promised land. The, prom the land that I promised you, you just lost it. You say, well, that's pretty severe. Yeah. It's how God feels about complaining. It's how he feels about our complaints. Because they fly in his face. Everything that we complain about flies in the face of God, and it is offensive to him. So complaining hurts the heart of God. Second thing is complaining carries significant consequences, okay? There's significant consequences uh, to our, our uh, and, and that's what we're just talking about, that they cannot receive what they had been promised. Now, see, God wants to do the same for you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to care for you. He's made promises to you. But our complaining interferes with that relationship and angers the heart of God. The uh, think about a guy, a, a realtor. There's this, uh, there's this idea that we have that one of the consequences of, of 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 losing what we what God has promised to us, the consequence of losing those things. There was a realtor uh, that was selling houses and uh, had a family come in, and they were brand new in town, and so they were looking at the house that, that he was selling, and. They said, well, we've got a question for you. He said, what are the people like? What are the people like in this town, this small town? He said, well, that's a good question. Well, tell me, what were the people like in the town where you came from? He said, well, the people were terrible. They were the worst people. They were, oh, you, know, you just wouldn't believe what a horrible place it was. And he said, well, you know what? I hate to tell you, but you're going to find the same kind of people here. This is the same, same, same way here in this, in this town. They said, Okay. Next day, another person comes to look at the house, and they ask the same question. What about the people in this town? And the realtor says, well, <laughs> let me ask you, what are the people like in the town where you came from? They said, you wouldn't believe it. It was so wonderful. The people were so great, so gracious, so loving and giving. Said It was, it was just the best place to live. And the realtor said, you know what? You're going to find the same thing here. Best people you've ever seen. Wonderful, loving people. What was he saying? What was, he, what was he talking about? <laughs> There's an official term for this uh, that I had somebody remind me when I was trying to remember this term. It's called confirmation bias. Isn't that right, Madison? Yeah. Now we had a conversation, and I was describing this, and I couldn't remember the term for it. She popped it out just like that. Confirmation bias says that when you're biased about something, you already have a strong belief about something, that the way the mind is wired and the way we work is that we t once we ha are convinced of something, we begin to look for and seek out the things that confirm what our bias already is. Whether it's a bias for or against, we're going to begin to seek out and find things that support our belief. Now, everybody does that. It's just a, it's just a fact of the way we are wired as human beings. And so we need to be aware of that. So what the realtor is saying is, hey, you come in this town, you're looking for mean, heartless people, that's what you're going to find. If you come in this town, you're looking for loving, wonderful people, that's what you're going to find. If in your life you're constantly complaining about everything, it's going to drive everything that you want, what you're trying to get, what you would like to have in your life, it's going to literally push that away from you. Call it. Spiritual bad breath. Yeah, kind of, na kind of nasty thinking in it. What happens when you have bad breath? Well, I know on firsthand, I know a few times I've struggled with that. You know, it's like people suddenly going, mm, 
You don't want to stand close to somebody that's got bad breath, right? You know that when you have, when you're complaining, it's a kind of a spiritual bad breath. And people don't want to get close to that negative spirit. And so what happens is you start driving people. I wonder why you don't have any friends. Stop complaining. Just quit complaining. It's costing you so very much. So what do we do? Because here's the thing. I complain just like you do. And when I began to really, really look at what the Bible says, it's quite an eye-opener to realize that God is offended by our complaining. And so what do we do about it? How are we going to stop? I'm going to give you three things this morning. The what, the why, and the how of, of complaining. The what, the why, and the how. The what is easy because we've just been talking about it. That is, stop complaining. Do not complain. That's the what. That's what we're seeking. That's what we're trying to do. Remember we said last week that if we, if we want to do something, if, we, if God gives us a desire, God wants something for our lives, if God wants it and we agree with what God has already said he wants and we step out in faith in agreement with God, then whatever it is that we're trying to change or trying to bring about will come to pass. Not maybe, it will. God will bring it to pass. He said, once you start, once you take the first step of obedience, he said, I'm going to come right along beside you. That's what he said to Aaron. That's what he said to Moses. I'm going to speak through you. I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to help you. So the moment we decide I'm going to quit complaining, I believe God will step in and help us. Amen. Okay? So the, the, the what is don't complain. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. I love this verse. Listen to this. Do everything without, say it with me, complaining. Do everything without complaining and arguing. There's the command, clear as you can find it, right there in the Word of God. It wasn't the pastor that said it. It was the Apostle Paul that said it. Stop complaining. Do everything. It kind of reminds me of another verse we talked about last week. Whatever you do, do it all for what? The glory of God. Whatever you do. In other words, everything in your life that you do is done for the glory of God. We talked about that last week. But you know, it strikes me that this is a very similar passage, isn't it? You know, I think, in fact, the two ideas go together. Because if we're going to do everything for the glory of God, then we cannot be complaining about it. Because when we complain about it, we take the glory away from God. We make it about ourselves. We become the center of our story, and we make it about us rather than about him. So the moment we begin to complain, that connection with God is severed. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Okay? That's what it says in Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't let, don't let those words, those unwholesome things, don't let that complaining come out of your mouth. Have you ever heard the term, you're going to bite your tongue? Yeah. What does that mean? It means... Don't say whatever it is that's getting ready to come out of your mouth. Bite your tongue, right? Did your parents ever tell you that? Better bite your tongue, boy. Yeah. That means you need to stop. Whatever it is that's beginning to rise up and fix to come out of your mouth, you need to bite it. You need to pinch it off. Could I just suggest, listen, this isn't me standing up here today saying, you know, I've learned not to complain a long time ago when I've got it all together. Now you need to. I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm saying that I'm a complainer, and it's time I quit complaining. Okay, it's time to stop complaining. So here's what I'm saying. I'm saying this is a commitment that I'm making right now. Okay, I'm making a commitment to stop complaining, to quit complaining. And so what I'm going to do is every time I, I think that that complaint is coming out of my mouth, what am I going to do? I'm going to, uh, okay, bite that tongue. Now I know since I'm the one standing up here making that statement that every single one of you are going to be watching and listening to see if I complain. And if I do complain, what are you going to say? Bite your tongue, pastor. Bite your tongue. Okay. All right. Who would join me in that commitment? Uh-huh. Look, look at you. Y'all are scared, aren't you? I don't know if I can do that. 
I won't have anything to say. Okay, the what? Do not complain. The why? Well, you might think that the why is because nobody will like you, which is probably true. You know, you may have a lot of reasons why that you need to stop complaining. But the biggest reason, the one that matters the most, is, it's, is that you can become so that you can become a lot more like Christ, right? Stop complaining so that we can... I, I mean, do you, do you see Jesus complaining much? Do you see Jesus complaining at all? No. It says this. Listen to Philippians again. Do everything without complaining or arguing. We've already talked about that. There's the command. That's the what. And here's the answer. Here's the why. Verse 15. So that. See, don't, stop your complaining and arguing. So that. Here's the reason that the Bible is telling us that we need to stop complaining. So that you may become blameless and pure. So that you can become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. How many of you would agree that we live in a crooked and depraved generation? Eh? Well, so was the one before ours. And so was the one before that. We live in a crooked and depraved world. It's a fallen, sinful world. Okay? So, in that darkness, the Apostle Paul is telling you that you can become blameless and pure. Now, what's interesting about that? It didn't say give all that you have to the poor and you will become. It, it didn't say teach this many Bible study courses and you will become. It didn't say pastor these, this many churches and you will become. No, he said stop complaining. <laughs> you, see the, you see the weight of what I'm talking, what we're talking about here. Stop complaining and you will become blameless and pure children of God. Who is blameless and pure and a child of God? Who was that? Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, blameless and pure. See, when we stop complaining, we begin to be more like Jesus. And isn't that the objective? Could it be that we could just maybe try? You see what I'm saying? Could we just try? Could we just acknowledge that this is standing between us and our God is standing between us and other people? It's standing between me and accomplishing what it is that God wants to accomplish with my life, and it's just one thing, and all I have to do is just stop it. That's pretty amazing to me. It says Luke chapter 6, verse 45, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, it is an internal job. It's an internal thing. It's not all out here. It's, it's in here. When we begin to change our heart, when we begin to change the source, then what we say will change as well. The last thing is the how. How do we stop? Well, uh, in if you look at Paul's context, he's writing in the book of Ephesians, uh, Philippians, right? Where was Paul when he was writing Philippians? He was in prison, right? And remember, we even talked about that, I think, last week. We, we said Paul in prison, and he didn't say, well, I can't go anywhere. I can't get out, so I just can't be, I can't do what God called me to do. That would, be, that would have been an excuse, right? But instead, Paul said, no, I'm in prison. I can't go anywhere. I can't write a letter. And I think the Philippians need to hear from him. Oh, and oh, he may not even realize that one day, 2,000 years later, that we would be reading it. Okay? And so, so Paul is in prison, and this is what Paul says. He says, I am so sick and tired of being in prison. This is terrible. The food stinks. It's cold in here. The, the floor is hard. That's not what he says. He writes to the Philippians, and he says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, you know what he's saying there when he says being poured out like a drink offering? He's talking about his potential death. He said, I may die in this place. I don't know what my future holds at this point. He said, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, he said, I am glad. Look at this, and rejoice with all of you. I am glad and I rejoice. I am glad and I rejoice. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I'm in prison. I'm not complaining. I'm rejoicing. Now I'm asking you, my friends, to stop complaining and start rejoicing with me. Do you know how we stop complaining? Do you know the how? We just rejoice no matter what. That starts, becoming, starts making sense, doesn't it? 
You know, where, where the scripture tell us, tells us to do all things, you know, do all things without grumbling. Do all things and rejoice in the Lord. God is working. But even if I am being poured out, I will rejoice. Let me ask you something. What might change in your situation if you stopped complaining about it and started looking at it carefully and, and seeing, God, where can I rejoice in this? You know, if I'm sitting in this traffic jam today, what can I do? How do I rejoice in this moment that you've given me? Is there some way, God, that I can just find joy in this moment? Yes, there is. What is it that needs to change in your life? Stop complaining about it and start doing something about it. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your goodness in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the promise of eternal life that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you that our lives are so very blessed. And we're going to actually give thought to it and start giving words to it. Lord, it really con convicts me of how often I have offended you. So I pray, Lord, today, I pray for your people, I pray for myself. Lord, I just pray that you would do what you promised to do, that you would walk alongside us. Lord, that you, in, this, in the midst of this need for change, Lord, that you would bring about a mighty work of your spirit in our lives. And Lord, we stand here today just imagining, just imagining what could happen in this church if we just stop complaining and quit making excuses. Lord, what could happen in this world if every church began to stop complaining, quit making excuses, started doing the work that you called us to do, Lord? We could see a revival. We could see your name uh, light up this darkness. And we pray this today for the lives of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we go into this time of invitation? Whatever it is that God is speaking to you about this morning, I pray at the very least is where you stand that you would make a commitment to stop complaining, quit complaining. Let it, it just move it out of your life. Whatever else that God may be speaking to you about this morning, this is your time right now to respond. I'm here to pray with anybody that has a need as we begin to worship this morning. In the crushing and in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you into your careful hand when I trust you I don't need to understand so make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. And in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground and you are breaking new ground so make me a vessel
carry your new fire today. Cause where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames and carry your new fire today. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Oh, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. You can be seated. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Great song for what we're talking about today. Uh, we need to get a little new wine instead of that old complaining, right? Okay. A couple of announcements we have this morning. First of all, we have newcomers class coming up this afternoon at 5 o'clock. We're going to meet in this wing down this side as you go out the double doors. And uh, we'll meet at 5 o'clock. If you're new to McQueenie Baptist, maybe you're thinking about joining, being a part of this fellowship, we'd enjoy and encourage you to come and join us in the newcomer class. We answer a lot of questions, just try to uh, address any questions and issues that you might find or have. And so uh, that's at 5 o'clock this afternoon. You know, just keep in mind that we are still signing up volunteers for Vacation Bible School, kind of getting early sign-up done. And so that's also in the table down the hallway there. You'll see that. Uh, we're, we're beginning pre-registration. We've got pre-registration going for Vacation Bible School, as well as Kids Camp. And you'll see that in the bulletin as well. Kids Camp, there's a a, a QR code that you can scan will take you directly to the, uh, to the uh, registration form. And by the way, pass those forms in that you filled out earlier. Those connection cards, y'all get those out and pass them to the center aisle. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And so um, you'll see that uh, registration has begun. We're trying to get started early this year, getting everything lined up and working, working well. So please keep those things in your prayers and get signed up and help with the vacation Bible school. It would be very, very much appreciated. All right, let's all stand together. Thank you again for coming and being here today. Appreciate it so very much. Um, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, who am I going to ask? Will. How about, Strain, how about lead us in a word of prayer this evening?